Welcome to the 1000 GM Player Profiles. I am very excited to bring you Women's Grandmaster WGM, Tatav Abrahamian, one of my favorite players in <laughs> Southern California and in the United States. Uh, welcome, Tatav. How does it feel to be here? Hey, thanks for having me and for the nice introduction. <laughs> Uh, you're welcome. I mean, I've known you probably more than than any of the players that longer. I've known you longer than any but any of the players that I, that I've interviewed on the channel. So I'm very excited to interview somebody that I've known for a while and I've seen playing fearlessly in <laughs> in you know strong events in California and in the United States. Um, so let's start first though with some questions from our sponsor, 1000 GM. So the first thing they want to know is uh how how much does it cost to attend a tournament like this normally as a norm seeker um you're you told me before the before the interview started that you'll be seek, you'll be seeking mostly rating because you've received your i am norms already um mm -hmm. how many how many tournaments did it take you to receive all all of your i am norms uh, I'm not sure. I want to say all my norms came from open tournaments. Oh, okay. I don't think I've gotten any from closed tournaments. Um, <laughs> sorry. That's all right. You go, ahead, go ahead and say that one more time. <laughs> um, hold on. Let me lower the volume. That's funny. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I heard the thing. I was like, oh, Make I was sure mine is down too. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, what do you want me to say again? Oh, yeah. I'll ask the question again. So, how much have you spent on attending tournaments to gain rating and norms in general? Can you even quantify that? No, I can't quantify it because, um, especially when I was a bit younger, I used to play a lot, maybe play once a month. Mm -hmm. And playing tournaments is like very costly. The entry fee, staying in a hotel, the food, the cost of travel is just very expensive. So I don't know, I don't know how, I can't really say how many tournaments it took me to get all my necessary norms. And um, I think I got all my norms from open tournaments. I don't think I've gotten any from an invitational tournament. Um, but uh, yeah, I think, I mean, playing chess, playing chess as a hobby is very cheap. All you need is a chess board. <laughs> chess competitively is very, very expensive because you have to travel because chess is very concentrated. Right. You can get a quality tournament just anywhere. You have to travel to a specific location to play a quality tournament. Right. And how much how much are you paying for the 1000 GM event? I'm not paying anything. Yeah, it's free, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's nice. How how does that make you feel to be able to play a tournament like this for free? I mean, it's very nice because um you know when you're spending a lot of money on a tournament you're also taking time off from working the loss is just so much yeah especially like any tournament you know like for someone like me playing in an open tournament like i know i'm not gonna make money because i'm not gonna win an open tournament and tournaments like norm tournaments like this also usually don't have um even when you play a pay an entry fee usually don't have prizes right so you're right. basically just spending money and then so he's spending money and you're not earning for a week. So that puts a lot of financial pressure on someone. Yeah. Where do you normally stay when you, when you play these kind of events? Uh, depends where the event is. If it's somewhere where I know someone, maybe I can stay with them. Usually a hotel. Yeah. Usually a hotel and that's expensive. Um, what are, are the conditions of the hotel and where you stay important to you when you're playing? Uh, yeah, I like, um, like, I don't have to stay obviously in a five star hotel, but um, I prefer staying in a hotel. Uh, I think it puts me in a better mindset mm -hmm. because, like, I'm in a hotel. I know I'm playing a tournament. Like, this is what I'm there for. And, um, like, I like to play in a city where I have access to, like, restaurants or, like, somewhere to go to. It's like maybe change your scenery if, like, things are not going well. Right. So, like, I, as a chess player, it's very important that you have access to f good food and it's nearby and, you know, you have options. Because if you're somewhere where you don't have this option and your games run late, sometimes you don't have the option to eat. <laughs> oh, man, that, that would be terrible. Have you ever had to skip a meal? I'm just curious. Um, I mean, like, I don't eat super late. I don't eat, like eating close to my bedtime. It just doesn't make me feel good. But, yeah, I mean, like, if you... I mean, now we have DoorDash, so that makes life easier. But if you're playing in a tournament where you... Like you're really, you know, you're near an airport or like you're not in a city, then I mean, sometimes everything is just closes early near you, right? 
Right. And do you usually stay by yourself or do you usually have a roommate when you're you're staying at the tournaments? <laughs> well, I mean, this is one of the downsides of being a female chess player, right? There's not usually there's a handful of girls. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know them, maybe you don't want to stay with a stranger or, you know, a lot of people are couples, so they stay with their significant other. But like as a woman, the probability of you finding a roommate is very low, actually. Yeah, so it's, that sounds pretty tough, actually. And just generally, with all of these barriers, do you think there is a systemic discrimination in chess towards financially privileged players? It, that's a pretty hard question, I know. So, um, I mean, of course, of course, if you have money, life is just easier, right? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like, if you're financially well off, your family financially well off, then it's very helpful. Otherwise, um, maybe you need to find some kind of financial support. I mean, if we look at successful players, um, the ones who are, like, really, really successful, right, they do have, like, a lot of support. They get some kind of sponsorship because you it's very difficult to have this burden on you to play chess and also, like, the burden of playing chess itself. Um, so even if we have people from countries um, like, you know, they have like a lot of government support or things like that. So I think I think for a player to like really develop, they do need a lot of financial help, because training, traveling. If you're a kid, you need someone to travel with you. So someone needs to take you know, time off or should be non-working. Right. So, um, yeah, the finan financially like competitive chess is very expensive. Okay, let's move on though to your your experience in chess. First, I want to hear um, when you started playing and what got you into chess. Uh, I started playing when I was eight. I kind of by accident. I was at my dad's work. He was like cleaning his desk and he had a chess set. So you know, I just asked him like, "What is this?" And he was like, "Okay, I'll teach you." And he said he taught me by having me watch him play his friends or his friends um, yeah. play. Uh, so I picked it up very quickly. I grew up in Armenia. Chess is huge in Armenia. And um, it's very easy to get into chess and like very respected <laughs> game. Right. So like if I go back to what I was saying about the government support, uh, you know, usually countries that have this kind of support, they like respect chess a lot. Like playing chess is a very respectable profession there. Right. So people like it's something people like actually want to do. It's like a career route for a lot of people. Like, you know, I'm going to become a chess player. Uh, so Armenia is like one of those countries. I mean, that's pretty amazing. And when when did you know that you would want to become a professional player? Was there any point? Or I mean, I don't think there is any point. I think at some point it just becomes like part of your life. <laughs> I don't think there's like one. Um, I mean, maybe for some people, but I don't think there was one point that was like, okay, this is what's going to be. So when did you start playing tournaments then? You started playing at eight and then you started playing tournaments at what? Eight? I started playing tournaments at nine, I would say. Um, I mean, the Olympiad was also happening in Armenia in 1996 and my dad would take me all the time. Oh, but it was like, I mean, the Olympiad is just such a big festival and such a big celebration of chess. It was like so amazing for me to see that. And I think it's probably every Olympiad is a big um, inspiration for a lot of people. Do you remember watching any specific players there? I'm just curious. Oh, yeah. I remember watching Judith. And I was like, oh, my God, this is so cool. <laughs> Judith is playing in this tournament. And she was playing in men's section, right? And I was like, wow, this is so cool. Yeah. Um, That's incredible. Um, probably when I started playing at nine, because you have to play this, like, category tournaments. Um, in Armenia, we don't have this system. You know, you play a tournament, you get a rating. You have to play in this category tournament, and you have to score a certain number of points. I think you had to score, like, seven and a half out of nine. So you go category four, three, two, one. And then when you go to first, you get first category, you get a rating of 2000, like a national oh, rating. Oh, wow. So you didn't even get a rating until you earned your way all the way up to categories. No, no, yeah, that's just a different system, which was interesting when I moved to the US because it was so shocking to me. So like I got those and then I played um, well, that was in the Armenian. That was the minimum FIDE rating as well. I mean, feeder ratings were very different back then, yeah. yeah. Like, you couldn't go below a certain thing. Yeah. And then I played the Armenian Girls Championship under 10. I won that. And then, wow. like, when I was nine, I played um, the World Youth under 10. So, like, very quickly. Did you have a coach before yeah. that? Or did you... Oh, yeah, yeah. So, then I started having, like, my dad took me to the chess school in Armenia. So, I had a coach. So, when I was already playing tournaments, I had a coach. Do you want to shout out your, your early coach? 
Oh uh, yeah, his name is Gagik Sarkisyan. He's one of the general, most generous, the best people I've known. Like when I go to Armenia, it's like one of the first people I visit. Awesome, that's excellent. Um, and so then you started, you won, you won the girls' championship, and then, you know, I mean, what rating are, are you at about that point when you won that? I'm. I don't know. I mean, this was like when I was nine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no big deal. So then, when when did you earn your first title then? I don't know. <laughs> was it I mean, you ask me very difficult questions yeah, right now. Yeah, it was it was that early then. So you 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 basically like like a FIDE title? Yeah. What was your first FIDE title? I mean, I had a WFM title from some tournament. I don't remember what. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. No big deal. Yeah. That's not that's not super important. I was just curious because some players like work their way up and they're kind of laddering up their titles, but it just seems right. like you were born super competitive. <laughs> I mean, you just went from learning at eight to winning a championship at 10, right? So. At nine. Yeah, <laughs> no, nine. But, uh, I mean, you know, like in Armenia, when my parents took me to my coach, like my coach was on training me to, I don't know, spend like a couple of hours a week playing chess. It was to like become a chess player. Right, right. But it was, you know, like that was the point of you being there. Right. And then when did you come to the United States? 2001. 2001. And did you, you move with your parents moved here? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And then, I mean, there's a huge Armenian community in Los Angeles. So did you fit in right away or was there a, a big adjustment? <laughs> no, it was a very huge adjustment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and how did that impact your chess? Um... I mean, if I look at it through just that lens, I think negatively. Yeah. Because in Armenia, chess was huge. And then as I left, there were huge developments in Armenia. Right. They're getting more financial support. They started a chess academy, which still exists. So they would take the like talented kids and they would get free coaching and like, which is such a huge thing, right? Yeah. So like there was um, a lot of support for young uh, up and coming players and um, like chess in America is experiencing a boom and it's becoming very popular. It wasn't the case in 2001. Yeah. So, yeah. so it was like very different. I mean, so again, if I just look through just that lens alone, I think it's probably affected my chess negatively. Yeah. Yeah. And then, but what did you do to continue playing and improving? Were you just driven because you love chess? I mean, yeah, I mean, because at that point I just played chess for so long. I was a pretty high rated player. I mean, maybe it's unfair to say that it was negative because like I qualified for US championships. I was already playing in the US championships when I was 16. Right. We didn't have the same sponsorships that we have now. We didn't have these great prize funds, but I, I mean, like, okay, I, I would have to like really think about the statements that it's evaluated negatively, like, but. Um, no, that's okay. I mean, that's just your initial reaction. But I mean, you kept playing and you and you. Yeah, I mean, I kept playing in opens and in Armenia, we didn't have so many tournaments and uh, like chess is very different in the US, even for scholastic tournaments in Armenia, it was like one round a day, which I think if you're a beginner player, like tournament shouldn't last that long. It just uh, I mean, I think it's just great respect <laughs> of chess, like chess should be played one round a day, but I don't think for a beginner player that's yeah. necessary. And um, so I started playing an open tournament in Armenia. I didn't play open tournaments. We didn't have that many tournaments. So I would usually play in like youth tournaments and like right. year one championship or like category, like age category tournaments. Um, yeah. So, I mean, okay. Then I started playing maybe more title players. So in that sense, right. probably that was positive for me. How many U.S. championships have you played? Uh, I played since I was 16, so I don't know. But, but there was one year when there was like two, so many. I played in a lot of US championships. Wait, 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 wait. I'm not, I'm not letting you get away with that. How many total? <laughs> I want to hear the number because I know it's huge. It's like six, seven, eight. No, well, since I was 16 and now I'm 34, oh, so yeah. like 17. 17. Wow, there you go. That's, that's crazy. And you played every year? Yeah. You haven't missed a year? Mm-mm. -hmm. Let's go. That's pretty amazing. I actually don't think I knew that. I, my research was shoddy. I apologize. Uh, wait, you said 17 years or 18? Well, years? well, I haven't played one in this year yet. Okay, so. Yeah, so 17. So, so after you play a big event like that so many years in a row, I mean, what motivates you to go back? Well, I mean, it's a national tournament. It's a good event. Um, 
it's a prestigious event and over the years with you know the help of St. Louis Chess Club there is big prize fund and like why why wouldn't I play a like a good event like why would I not be motivated to play in it yeah. when you love chess yeah that makes sense um so then have you won any of those no I haven't how how important is it to you to to, to win one Oh, it's very important. Like I've been playing in it for so long and I finished second so many times that it's just frustrating not to have won one. Yeah, I, I mean, I've personally followed you the last few years and I've watched you play and I'm just like rooting every year. I'm rooting. I'm like, is she, she's going to do it this year. <laughs> and I mean, it's it's pretty obvious you have the talent and the ability. Um, what what are you working on in your game to, you know, to take it to the next step and actually get that first place? Uh, well, right now I'm preparing for Olympiad and um, I mean, right now I have a full time job, so it's a bit difficult to do that. But also uh, the pandemic was quite difficult I had very little motivation and no tournaments to play. So there was like a really waste. I didn't really work on chess and it just feels like there's so much chess information that um, there's so many tournaments, there's a constant like this flow of like new information coming out, a new chess course, a new opening, a new this, a new that, and there's like so many things to catch up on. Uh, so I'm just, um, <laughs> I mean, like it becomes impossible to, unless you're working on chess like full time and all the time, it's just impossible to keep up with all of this information. So right now I'm preparing for Olympiad, I'm reading through this Dvaryatsky book, and I am uh, just working on my openings. Is, is the Olympiad a, a one of your favorite tournaments or? Oh yeah, it's my absolute favorite tournament. It's just such a great event. There's like everyone from every part of the world, like every almost every country is there. It's just such a great celebration of chess. Yeah. It's just such a great environment. And this year it's in India. Have you played in India before? No, I haven't. It'd be my first time going. Oh, wow. That's exciting. Um, it's your first time going. It's going to be very hot, I heard. Are you, yeah. you going to deal with the heat? <laughs> uh, hopefully the tournament hall is not far from the hotel. <laughs> That's the hope. Okay. Well, okay. I want to drill down a little bit more before we move on to the rapid fire questions. Just two more minutes on your training, because I, I want to hear um, where you think you have to really work on. It sounds like you're reading the Varetsky book. Are you working mostly on endings right now? Um, no, no. It's like, uh, it's not an ending book. Oh. It, um, it's like how to like piece implement or like maneuvering your pieces. Okay. It's just like work doing puzzles every day. And he has like different parts of the game. So there's like queen and rooks, queen lands position, opening, um, middle game. So it's all parts of the game. Oh, I, I forgot. The question I forgot earlier was, are you, are you also coaching? No, time. not right now, because right now I just have one student. Right now I have a full-time job. So actually okay. I don't live in California anymore. I live in Kansas City because I oh. took a job here. So I'm not coaching right now. Well, congrats on, on your new job. That's oh, amazing. Thank you. I'm sad that you moved away from California. <laughs> I love seeing you at the tournaments and just watching your games every time. I mean, you have such an incredible attacking style. Um, how do you think having a full-time job will affect your career? Uh, well, I've been here for a year. I actually work for a startup. It's a chess startup. We make oh, smart chess boards. And my company is very supportive of me. I have three months a year to play chess. And oh, awesome. they're very supportive of my chess. Like, if I'm away at a tournament, like, I'm not asked to do anything work-related. Um, so it's nice to have this kind of support. If I take need to take a day off for, like, a weekend of training or something, like, I get that kind of support. So obviously it takes up a lot of time every day to go to work and come back and a lot of your energy too. Yeah. Um, but it gives me, on the other hand, some financial stability, right. which is hard to have as a chess player and also like having support. I know a lot of people are struggling with their jobs and, you know, they don't feel like they're um, being treated well at their works. And like, I have a lot of support. So I appreciate that. Can you say the name of the company? Uh, it's Bright Labs, it's spelled oh, with a Y, okay. and the board, the smart chess board we're making is called Chess Up. Oh, that's cool. And what's this? I don't even know what a smart chess board is. So, <laughs> so it has an embedded AI, and then it also has an AI through the app. And awesome. like when you touch a piece, all the squares it can go to lights up according to strength, so it can help you learn as you're going. When if you're playing someone much weaker and much stronger, it like balances the game between the two. 
and are you on a prototype or is it a... No, we're shipping already. Wow, that's excellent. Well, congrats. That's oh, cool. thank you. Um, that's super exciting. Okay, but I want to move on because we're, we're getting on in time. So let's move on to the rapid fire portion. These are just totally silly questions. <laughs> so have some fun. Uh, the first question is, who's your favorite superhero? Can I go with is Catwoman a super, superhero? Oh, yeah, she's definitely there we a superhero. Go. Catwoman, <laughs> Catwoman's awesome. Okay, that's a good one. Um, do you have a favorite chess movie or TV show? There are not that many, so no, not really. <laughs> that's pretty good. Uh, no one's answered that before. That's a unique answer. Okay. Um, what do you do to calm your nerves when you play? Like during the game? Yeah. Um, do you do anything specific? or? No. I mean... I'm just a wreck. <laughs> I'm just a ball of uh, anxiety. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, oh, Fabi once told me. I asked him what he did to calm his nerves, and he told me he 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 didn't. He <laughs> he, he was definitely nervous the whole game. <laughs> uh, so that's pretty funny. Um, let's see. Oh yeah, I had some more fun ones. Uh, do you do you like any sports other than chess? Uh, I don't play any sports, but I really love working out. Okay, great, great. Do, is there anything specific that you do to train for, for working? Uh, I really out? like lifting weights. Oh wow, awesome, awesome. Do you do you what what other things do you do for fun? Do you read books, watch TV? Uh, I like to travel for fun. Uh, I like, I love food, so I like just go trying new restaurants. Oh, like, awesome. um, well, that goes really in line with my my next question. What's your favorite holiday destination? Holiday destination. Ooh, Travel. Spain. Spain. Awesome. Where? Where in Spain do you, do you like to go? I love all of Spain. Spain is just like such a magical place. I love Barcelona. I was in uh, south of Spain in 2020 and awesome. it's just it's just indescribable how amazing Spain is. Great. And then what's your favorite food there since you said you like the, the food? Oh my gosh, food in Spain is so good. Um, <laughs> I'm making you hungry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't think I've ever had food in Spain that it like, oh, paellas, their paellas are amazing. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay, okay, I like that. Um, and they also have this bubbly wine, cava, that's like amazing. Oh, cava, that's the Spanish champagne, but it's not from mm -hmm. Spain, so they can't call it champagne. No, it's but that's, that's <laughs> sparkling wine. <laughs> okay, and then here's a really silly question. If, if they make a movie of your life in the future, what actor do you want to play you in the movie? Oh my god. I have to think of someone from the new generation. I don't know anyone from the new generation. You can say anybody. It doesn't matter. Uh, who do I like? <laughs> I don't I don't know actors very well, so it this is a hard question for me. So don't feel bad if you can't answer it very well. <laughs> if you just want to throw somebody out. Oh, I'll say Cher. I don't know if she's oh, an actor. Cher. <laughs> That's awesome. You want you want do you want 70s and 80s Cher or do you want modern Cher? Oh no! Sound like I want the sparkly, you know, yeah, okay. blammed up yeah, chair. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah, I like that. Um, okay, and then one more silly question: What would you? What message or what one thing would you like to tell your fans? One thing. Um, I don't have one thing. Thanks, thanks for being a fan. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great, great. Okay, excellent. So then, let's move on to the presentation of of your your game and. Um, go ahead and share screen when you're ready. Okay, perfect. Okay, looks good. Go ahead and look, give us a little background on on this game, who you played and and what what event it, it was at. Yeah, so this is from the World Cup, and this tournament happened last year. So World Cup is a knockout tournament, and actually for women this used to be a World Championship. So winner of this tournament used to be crowned as a World Champion, but then and then there was also a match the winner of which would be a world champion and the two are not connected. So it was like a really messy system. So I think at some point they're like, okay, this doesn't make sense. Let's <laughs> make things logical. Yeah. So it follows, now it follows the same logic as the men's like world championship cycle. So I qualified to this tournament from the 2019 US championships. So it was supposed to happen in 2020, but because of the pandemic, it didn't. Yeah, so it got moved to 2021 Great. and Great. they extended, uh, expanded the field. So instead of, 64 players it was um a larger number of players i don't remember okay. but it was a, it was such a system that they 
give more spots to people. And there was a number of people. Um, so the way the World Cup works, let's say we start with 64, right? And it's a knockout. So we've got 64, 32, 16, 8, 4, 2, and eventually a winner. Right. Um, and the way this um, this year worked, they they extend, expanded the field so they invited more players, but there were a number of players who didn't first play the same the first match, so they got seated into the second one. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, I mean, if I could quickly do math in my head, I would figure it out how many, so it actually worked, but I can't think of. Yeah, uh, I remember Fabi got seated into the second round. Yeah, like Fabi, Levon, like all this Magnus, and all these players got seated into the second round. Right. Yeah, so the same for women. So this was... Um, Coming out of the pandemic, this was one of my first tournaments. I think my first tournament coming out was the National Open in Las Vegas. And then this was going to be a big event. And this was in Sochi, Russia. So, you know, it was a very long journey. So, of course, you don't want to travel all the way there and get knocked out in the first round. So, right. um, you know, I tried hard to prepare. I played in the World Open beforehand and I had a horrible tournament. You know, these open tournaments are so brutal. Um, and then... But then I was like, okay, at least getting ready for this tournament. So I'm playing Victoria Radeva from Bulgaria. Where I rated, uh, and the way the World Cup works is like one plays 64, you know, two plays 63. So like the highest rated player plays the lowest rated player, unlike a Swiss tournament. So like people in the middle, their ranks, their ratings are very close to each other. So if you're somewhere in the middle of the pack, you're playing someone close to your rating. So like actually this uh, change of the system kind of helped me because at my 23, 50, 60 rating, I used to play like a 2,500, just hard to do in the first round. So the tournament before I would play, like I played Kostinuk, I played um, Harika, so I got knocked out like in the first oh, round. But, so this one was nice, you know, playing someone my level and I was like, okay, equal field. Uh, so we're ready. It was her time, first time playing. I think she's quite young. I think at the time she was last year, she was 20, maybe 19, 20. So she was a young player. Uh, so first round, I got the white pieces. Um, so I played. So, so uh, I was quite well prepared against her. Yeah. And I played a line that I haven't played before, but, you know, it, um, this was preparation and looked dangerous for black because you know, in a Sicilian, if you get surprised, like it's it's very easy to mishandle a Sicilian and find yourself in trouble. Right, right. And you, okay, you, so you had all this prep. Yeah, uh, at some point she played a bit of a different move order. I think I had like Bishop B7 first, and I, there was some line um, I didn't look at so uh, at least um, wasn't so well analyzed. And, um, and then okay, but okay, like this is a game, right? So I'm playing like I know this looks very scary for Black, but this is the nature. Excuse me, this is the nature of Sicilians. Right. Um, so she plays knight c6, which trade, and she was and she was playing very quickly. And I was a bit drawn off because I played a line that I've never played before, and my opponent is playing very quickly. And I was like, oh my god, right. how did she know? Like she somehow prepared this. She was just like playing faster than me, and you know, I was like, this is my preparation. You're not supposed <laughs> to play faster than me. <laughs> so we're playing this line so far, you know. A3, I'm stopping before. And then she when she went H6, I was like, oh my God, like like already here I'm out of book. So I'm just on my own. And she's just like blitzing her moves. I'm like starting to get uncomfortable. And I'm like, first game, I'm playing white. Like, what is happening right now? This is getting so frustrating. Uh so I went G6, F5, and um, you know, like I don't know the objective evaluation of the position. I don't really know. Is this still book or uh because I'd seen up to like G4, G5, but I don't, I don't know if I'd seen it. I think this is like, a, if you follow computer line, I think it's still book, but I don't know if it's book like, yeah, I mean, this is a pretty rare line. Right. So we go here, she goes at five. So I think we play quickly here and here at this point, I remember I spent a lot of time because I was just like, I was calculating this and I feel like this is like a very good game by me. Like my calculation was very clear here. I could like calculate well and see things well. Mm -hmm. And I was calculating some like crazy line here and just giving up this. And I think calculating, taking only six, there's some line I calculated that I thought was like complicated. And I was like, should I go for this? And then I was like, okay, this is the first game. Like, don't go crazy. 
Yeah. Unless, you know, and like my coach told me, if you're going to go crazy, make sure it works. Otherwise, just like stay calm. Well, yeah. And I, just, just for people that don't know your style, you love aggressive attacking positions, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I like this kind of dynamic positions. They're very fun to play. Yeah. Um, but, you know, if you're playing in a knockout tournament, <laughs> it's kind of scary. Because if you lose with the white pieces, then it becomes like, then the next game you have black and you're in a must win position with the black pieces. So that's right, pretty right. tough. <laughs> So I was like, okay, let's not go crazy. Let's defend this tonight. She goes here, rook in the center. And then, so I take, and then I win a pawn. And I think here, or like maybe a few moves before, she just started thinking. And then I was like, okay, maybe. And I think maybe it's like one of those cases that like she really prepared it. So like she looked at it very thoroughly and then she got to the board and then she was like, Maybe it just doesn't feel that comfortable, right? Right, right. Uh, so, okay, she cannot take on c3 because I have this intermediate check. I'm not actually losing a piece. So that's why she moves her king out of the way, which is um, it was a strange move. If I remember correctly, she has to put like a rook in the center. So she's down a pawn, but she has two bishops. My pawns aren't that impressive. Right. And right. she has some long-term compensation, but I think maybe she gave up a pawn and she felt like, you know, I'm down a pawn. I don't want to play this whole game down a pawn. Like I have to like start looking for things. So this King H8 move is actually uh, not that great because now you're going to start having some back rank issues, which with the queen and two rooks on the board, it's kind of hard to foresee, but you know, now your king is in more of a suspicious position. And um, she kind of gives me time to start regrouping. So I go back now I'm stopping this A5 push because this guy is hanging. Maybe I should take with the queen. But my chess base decides to take with the knight. Um, so she puts a rook in the center, and now I start fixing my pieces. Yeah. So now my knight will go to d4. So this is a clever move I cannot take because now I'm pinned. Right. But now uh, my knight starts going. So now I'm threatening knight h5, kicking this bishop away, maybe followed by... Let me draw my arrows. Something like this, yeah, and then maybe yeah, doing this, yeah, or yeah, also yeah. at some point, maybe my knight can also go to, well, not in this position, go to e4 if this queen moves away, or like she moved the, the rook away, and then, oops, not that, and kind of start harassing this bishop. Right, right. We got chess space, is so non cooperative. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think this position already becomes uncomfortable for her. And if she trades, then check or something. Let's say I move away and now both knight h5, knight e4. Um, like the structure favors me. I can play bishop before, attack this pawn too. It goes to e6. So already, like, now I'm just up a pawn. Right. right. I don't know if I'm going to win this 100% of the time, but like, it, it just like she didn't get the um, counterplay that she was looking for. Right. So right. I'm just, you know, pressing. So she went rook e c8, uh, like trying really hard for, uh, to go for some counterplay. Okay, my queen is hanging, I'm pinned, so I run away, a5. Right. And there is no point of me going pawn hunting. So I simply bring my knight to the center. So I'm threatening the bishop, I'm threatening the queen. So she either has to trade queens or, and go to an unfavorable endgame, or she has to take my knight. And now things have become very comfortable for me. Like this, uh, any ghost of attack has disappeared. It's like I'm harassing her queen. We exchange a lot of pieces. So she goes queen h5. And and I, I saw this like from really far away. I kind of, because I could also sense her frustration a bit. Like she's looking for this counterplay and she's not finding it. So she, I think after when she played rookie c8, or like I, I could actually see like what's gonna come because I could see she's like trying to create some kind of attack on the queen side, make something happen. It's not there, but you know, like when you're frustrated and you're looking for something, you just try to make it happen regardless of whether it's there or not. Now I have this really nice tactic of taking on a5. And this is going back to what I mentioned about back rank issues, which was very hard to see when she played King h8 here. Yeah, that, but yeah, now we're like seven moves later. Right, and now she can't take your bishop. You just get a, you gain that extra free pawn. I'm gonna wait for that to pass. Oh. Yeah, thanks. 
an emergency car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so now I take on a5 and geometrically it's really nice. You cannot take because back rank mate. Right. And so all the pawns are now weak too. Yeah. And there's also no b4, which is really nice because then my bishop takes and then my bishop blocks this whole b file. So she took here. I take another pawn. She goes back. And now I have another very nice move, bishop d8. Oh, Again, wow. the oh. same idea of this back rank. Oh, I didn't uh, even realize the, you know, when I saw this before the, the interview, I didn't realize how, how important of a move that was. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this, this felt really good playing it over the board. And now e8 is mate. He cannot take because now I just give up all my pieces and I'm checkmating. All right. Of course, you cannot take with the bishop for the same uh, for the same uh, issue, and um, yeah, that would be a Morphe game from you know 1850. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now this back rank mate is just coming, so she has to give up her queen. Takes, and now I have another really nice shot. I take the bishop. I don't take a rook with oh, the idea being wow. if she takes queen e7 and queen h7 so mate is unstoppable. Wow, look at that queen e7. I like that a lot. That's beautiful. Man. Yeah, so at this point, so she's she just... any compensation there at all then, really. No, nah, I mean, it's just made. Now I'm just up a queen. Yeah, so no. she pushes her pawn. Um, oh, yeah, and this was kind of clever because if I take with the pawn and she takes... Of course, okay, I still should be winning because I'm up like a million pawns, but now there's no queen e7 because now I get oh, made. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay, she finds some resource, which is kind of always unpleasant no matter if the resource is objectively good or bad like if you think the game is over and then your opponent makes a move and now you still have to find a move but luckily my position is completely crushing so i just go rook f7 i just take queen e5 and i'm just my queen is so dominant yeah she just can't do anything and here yeah. no there's no checks there's no anything i have an extra queen and position is just collapsing Wow, what a beautiful game. I like that. Show that bishop d8 move again. That's yeah, I mean, I'm quite proud of this bishop d8 That's move. <laughs> That's the kind of move that you, you know, you always want to play. I mean, that's just, it's just the, the, uh, uh, it, it, just the geometry of it and just how beautiful it looks on the board. <laughs> Yeah, sometimes I'm like, you know, I look at my games and I'm like, oh, I'm capable of playing the chess. <laughs> <laughs> and then did you win this match? Yeah, I did, because second round she was in a must win situation. She put me under a little bit of pressure, but then um, I won that game too. Sometimes, you know, like in matches, like we see this and people are like surprised, but when you're in a must win situation, it's very likely that you're going, that, I don't want to say very likely, but you know, what is what is the difference between a draw and a losing, right? You're still losing the match, so it's right. right. Like you, you can very easily just go to zero because you're just kind of going all out. Right, so she was right. trying really hard to beat me. And at some point, like, I think the position was kind of equal and then she just tried to press and then things went bad for her. Who did you play in second in round two? Uh, I played Muzicic, Anna. Oh my gosh. So it was the opposite. So I lost, oh, that was also a crazy game. So I lost with the black pieces and then, but okay, like my second game was quite bad, but I also lost to zero to her. Uh, let's, um, let's unshare and I'd love to talk about this just with five more minutes. Um, because I'm I'm very interested to hear these how what it's like to play against such a strong player like Muzichuk or you know anybody that any GM that you that you play I mean you you approach the game the same way as a normal player I guess or even a weaker player um, but what does it feel like to play someone like that? Well, I mean, this kind of tournaments are different, like the Olympiads and this tournament, because you know your opponents are really well prepared. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're, like, going to try to target you. Like, we're playing an open tournament and, um, you know, every like, okay, your opponent will probably, your GM opponent will probably know openings better than you, but they're not, like, prepared specifically against you. So they may not be able to completely, like, target you. So, and then, so it's more even if you play something, huh? Is it is it more intimidating in a closed event like that, where they know you're, you're going to... I think so, because my repertoire is not very flexible. Mm -hmm. And like, it's just kind of, I mean, I'm trying to work on that, but it's always been very easy to kind of target me. So when someone like prepares something against me, I'm like, okay, what's going to happen to a terrible thing is about to happen to me right now. <laughs> but yeah, I think that's uh, always been problematic for me because I kind of 
always stuck to my well-known openings, so, which makes me a very easy target, especially like in this team event or something, right? Like you, they have four people to prepare against and like one of them is super predictable. So that makes their life very easy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, so I think in that regard, it's it's quite challenging to play in this kind of tournaments. Who, who's the strongest player that you've ever played? Uh, I played both Hikaru and Wesley in a rapid tournament. Oh. Uh, That's not the, at, when they were like 2800, right. but you know, still, still <laughs> I think, I think Wesley was already 2700 when I played him in the rapid tournament, or he probably was. was. Is a game with someone like that fun, even though you know that your chances of winning are so slim? Uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, anybody, right? Because they're pretty much gods in America. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's actually a good question, if it's fun. I, I remember I was playing Wesley, he played like a Shevaningen, and I was just like attacking, and I was like so optimistic, and then I was just like, <laughs> like, I, like my position just like fell apart, and I was like, oh my god, why was I so thrilled about this? It was like played up, like it just played like so easily. Uh, I think I would appreciate more now than before, I, I want to say. Is that, is that just because of, of maybe you were just so competitive then no i think i don't know i think my i would like approach the game differently mentally um so how i mean i, I guess that that's an interesting question as as you get older because you were a prodigy and now you know you're not old but you know as chess players go you know the young players are like you know they're teens now they're getting titles and they're playing in their teens as as you're getting older has have you seen your style change at all or um yeah i started um i, I started to try to think about chess a little differently i've been more open mm -hmm. about experimenting different structures and trying to play different things i think because of engines now almost everything is playable or so you can just play whatever <laughs> you just like I mean, it's like people both know everything and they don't know, I mean, nothing. <laughs> I mean, like, okay, that's a very general thing to say, right? Like sometimes like Fabiano, he just has so much knowledge, but then, um, right. so I think it's, you can actually play something without having to know it very deeply. You can try to find some kind of an idea, like you can turn on like Lilo or Stockfish and try to find some idea and be more comfortable playing it. Um, so yeah, I think there's some things have changed. I think I've become more open to um, post studying the game more on my own, more not just like looking at games, not just like, okay, I'm only going to look at this game because it was in my opening, but like trying to like be more open-minded about different structures and like trying to like learn new structures, new openings. Well, yeah, I mean, we're from a generation that's on the borderline of computers and really strong computers, right? Of course, mm -hmm. we were computers when we were young, but now there's like insanely strong computers. Do you like that change? Or do you think that makes chess just way more complicated? Um, I mean, it doesn't matter if I like the change, like this was ine inevitable. <laughs> Once there is a, yeah. like, there's this progress, it just keeps going. It's not like they make a 2600 level computer and they're like, okay, we're done. This is good enough. I mean, it's funny because like at some point you can, I heard it from like a strong grandmaster recently. It's like, there was a point when you could say something like the computer doesn't understand the position well, but like, you can't say that anymore because no, like, no. you cannot sit and argue with a computer. Um, not like Leela, if you're just running Leela. And... Okay, let me, it's my ice maker, sorry. Okay. Um, yeah, so now, yeah, I mean, this has happened. So we just have to learn how to cope with it. And the thing is, you also kind of, I don't know if everyone does it, but sometimes like when I'm preparing and I'm like looking at a line and just going down a rabbit hole and then you kind of have to be like, okay, my opponent is not probably sitting here and looking at this, some random line that I'm looking at, right? <laughs> like not everyone is just going down this rabbit hole. They're probably going down their own rabbit hole that I'm not looking at. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that obviously it has changed chess a lot and like opening preparation, like people are so well prepared now. The level of chess has just gone up so much. Like players who are like 2200 that I feel like 10, even 10 years ago, I could beat someone so easily. Now they just have so much knowledge. They just fight so much. And yeah. 
like they defend well they know like the end games they don't collapse and the openings they like know things that they're like yeah. why why do you know this that's why i'm so bad because i can't remember my openings to save my life so <laughs> yeah i mean yeah to the level of chess has just gone up so much yeah that's incredible well i think we have to wrap up here soon i've really enjoyed the conversation i hope that we can have a conversation like this again sometime in the future but thank you again for now and um is there anything that you want to say about you know the upcoming events 1000 gm event um are you excited to play oh yeah i am very excited to play um as actually varujan hakopian contacted me another you know former southern california player and yeah, both yeah. of us now living in missouri yeah. uh, I, I was very happy because it's just right before the olympiad which works really well for me so i'm actually pre- now i have the pairings so i'm preparing for this tournament like i know i said i'm preparing for the olympiad that's like the because it's a team event, you know, representing the US. It's like the main event, but first I'm preparing for this. And I'm very, like, the timing works so perfectly that I get to play a tournament before the Olympiad because I don't want to show up there rusty in, like, my first game, you know, I'm, like, not comfortable. Right. So I'm very much looking forward to it. It's going to be in St. Louis. That's, like, a very comfortable area for me. I've played there many times. So it's uh, just worked out really well. Well, awesome. Well, good luck, and I hope you progress. Oh, thank you. And... I know, obviously, it takes a lot to get the rating that you need, but with all those, no, you since you already have your I am norms, I hope that you can get, um, get your get the rating that you need, uh, yeah, within the near future. Thank you, I appreciate that. Okay, well, thanks again, and I will see you next time.